a very good day my dear post graduate students it is a dictum that we know the topics in recent advances and the topic for the day is pathogenesis and pathology of shock from recent advance 16 by evans and cross subheadings are subheadings think of the subheadings they take us to the answer in this particular article the authors have dealt with all the large letters in detail the definition etiology septic shock pathogenesis organ changes and histology the smaller ones they have just made a mention which we shall revisit at a later date by definition shock is defined as a decrease in the effective circulating volume of blood and hence the oxygen perfusion to the tissues basically there are four causes for shock hypovolemia cardiogenic sepsis and anaphylaxis and we can remember this very fundamental flow diagram it can be affecting the heart wherein it can turn out to be hypovolemic or a cardiogenic as in the case of a myocardial infarction or an obstruction vasculature when there is a peripheral vasodilatation it is more distributive common in septic anaphylactic or neurogenic shocks this is a beautiful flow diagram that i had taken from the department of pediatrics pga chandigarh and the journal is indian pediatrics way back 1999 it is a very simple one almost similar or akin to what we see in robins whenever there is a bacterial infection the lipopolysaccharides are being activated and you find that multiple steps are being enacted upon it can be a coagulation cascade or the activation of the macrophages and the monocytes the complement system and the endorphins so you find that coagulation cascade that can be a block to the blood vessels or that can be a disseminated intravascular coagulation the various cytokines as we shall be seeing in the subsequent slide the complement activation along with particularly the arachidonic acid metabolism it will be haunting us in many a talk and the endorphins finally you find that there is a shock or a multi organ failure a complex diagram like this how do i remember the key word is lipopolysaccharide second one is vasodilatation and endothelial injury remember these two things bridge them across septic shock it is more complicated than a normal blood loss it is multifactorial and the pathogenesis is unclear you find that a lot of organisms have been implicated this will be again repeated fungi that can be disseminated candidiasis that has been spoken about and this picture incidentally is a mesenteric ischemia i find that there is a redness and a viability and then it is turning black there is also some kind of edema this kind of a picture i can see in a valvulus in a case of a strangulated hernia also septic shock you find that it is far more complicated as i had mentioned caused by gram negative and gram positive organisms fungi as well as viruses such as the dengue gram negative can be klebsiella and meningococci gram positive staphylococci and streptococci ultimately they can result in various organ changes such as acute tubular necrosis mesenteric infarction and widespread coagulopathy what happens in this condition is there is a low systemic vascular resistance as a result of which you find that there is a peripheral pooling of blood there is no loss of blood but there is a peripheral pooling of blood the vaso pressures are inactive basically in shock there are two kinds of substances one is vaso excitatory material another is vaso depressive material you find in this case 
the vasodepressors are more active and the vasoconstrictors are ineffective. As a result of which there is vasodilatation and peripheral pooling of blood. Normally you find in shock that the heart and the brain will be getting the blood supply. But in this case, you find that there is a myocardial depressant also, as well as a blood supply to the heart. There is a decreased cardiac output because of the depressant. Other changes can be respiratory distress and lipopolysaccharide is a common endotoxin that has been implicated. The cascade of events we shall be seeing again. The mediators. Let us remember a few things. Nitrous oxide is one. Then the complement C3A, C5A, human necrosis factor. Nitrous oxide is an endogenous dilator. And C3A and C5A again cause vasodilators. And interleukins are there and there is an receptor antagonist to interleukin 1, RA1. And in the gram-positive organisms, there are a few substances such as staphylococcal enterotoxins or exfolitin. TSST1, that is toxic shock syndrome toxin 1 by Staphylococcus aureus. These can be functioning as a super antigen. Always an antigen is a substance that when introduced, it causes some kind of a reaction and the formation of the antibodies. Coming to TNF, tumor necrosis factor, it can be stimulated by the T cells. And there is something called as Cox postulates in immunology. He says that because of these steps, this is what is happening. Similarly, here also you find that it is found in experimental animals and when injected, it can lead to a septic shock. There is a neutralizing antibody which protects against it. And then depending on the levels of the tumor necrosis factor, the seriousness of the shock also shall be. So you find it is more or less a corollary. Direct toxicity to the endothelial cells can lead to a capillary leak. And this in turn can release the nitrous oxide and form a hypotension. It is an EDRF. These words alone I would like you people to remember. Endothelium derived relaxing factor. A beautiful flow diagram. This alone shall be my class. So there is an infection. There is a pro-inflammatory mediators consisting of the tumor necrosis factor, alpha, beta, interferon, gamma, and the platelet activating factor and the series of interleukins. This will be leading to the production of the interleukin-6 which stimulates the monocytes, activation of the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathways which lead to coagulation. And there is a consumption of the protein C and the protein S. Finally, there can be thrombosis and fibrin deposits. This is on one hand. On the other hand, there can be the activation of the complement system, vasodilatation, C3A, C5A. All this can lead to shock. Also, there can be the increased hormones such as the corticosteroids, glucagon, catecholamines, all of which will be leading to tissue hypoxia. Now, after this thrombosis, you find that there can be a disseminated intravascular coagulation, otherwise called as a consumption coagulopathy, as a result of which there is a bleeding, again leading to shock and tissue hypoxia. And there are some anti inflammatory these are all pro-inflammatory mediators. Anti-inflammatory mediators will be the other interleukins. So ultimately you find they promote a tissue hypoxia which can lead to death. For you to remember on one box I have given the names of the substances and in another box what are all the processes that is happening. I would like you to remember these two boxes the content is the same. What are the organ changes? ARDS is otherwise called as a traumatic wet lung or a post-traumatic lung insufficiency or a progressive lung consolidation or a shock lung. ARDS as well as shock lung can be asked as questions for us. It can happen in hypovolemia, septic shock is most common or in cardiogenic shock. Within about 48 to 72 hours, the patient is dyspneic and there is a pulmonary insufficiency. Look at this one. It is appearing more or less solid, not because the alveoli is filled with substances, but it is becoming more taut as is here. It is uniformly solid and airless because of the consolidation of the proteins over here. There can also be petechial hemorrhages. The weight is increased to three to four times. 
Thanks to pathology outlines for this beautiful reference. Here, what happens is there is a damage to two types of cells. One is the type 1 pneumocytes. This is the second most common organ that is affected. So it's a type 1 pneumocyte, and the other one is the endothelial cell. There is a production of the protein fluid in the interstitium and in the alveolar spaces. Finally, there can be hemorrhage and the hyaline membrane that can be followed that you are seeing here as eosinophilia. This is different from the hyaline membrane disease of childhood. Ultimately, you find that the various substances, oxygen radicals can be produced, which lead to damage to the endothelial cells and the epithelial cells. Exudation is there, proliferation of the type 2 pneumocytes as a compensation, production of fibrin and the hyaline membrane that you people are seeing. And look at the interstitium, it is wider. Normally, the alveoli are all back to back, but it is so wide, after all the inflammatory process, there will be fibrosis. Heart is the second most common organ. The lung is the first. So in this one, there can be commonly a cardiogenic shock or a hypovolemic shock. It can occur as a complication of myocardial infarction or sometimes it can lead to an infarction. So additional necrosis can be because of diminished perfusion. So you see that shock leads to necrosis, leads to shock. Ultimately, that can be death. Septic shock, you find that there is a disturbed function. Dysrhythmia can be there in about 17% of the fatal cases. And another feature is subendocardial petechial hemorrhages. There are two types of hemorrhages I'll be showing. And histologically, you find that there can be coagulative necrosis and contraction band necrosis. Whenever you are asked about the morphology of myocardial infarctions, these terms should come to your mind. Coming to the infarction, you find that so this is the endocardium over here. Below the endocardium, the gray region is the region of infarction. So it is subendocardial. Whereas it involves the entire wall, it is called as transmural infarction. There are other types. Basically, we'll remember because this is supposed to be more common in a case, case of septic shock. Look at this picture over here. There is a ventricular hypertrophy. Obviously, there is a shock and there is an early stage of an infarction that is seen in the subendocardial region. And microscopically at autopsy, you will be finding that there are areas of cariorexis, cariolysis, not much of inflammation amidst the viable myocardial fibers. Kidney is another organ that is important. The renal function is reduced or compensated. Acute renal failure commonly occurs. And Shock kidney means acute tubular necrosis. Though all cases of acute tubular necrosis are not shock kidney. There are various types. That itself is a question. We will deal with it at a later date. Renal cortical necrosis, ischemia, as well as disseminated intravascular coagulation can be seen. And you will be finding microthrombi in the glomerular capillaries. This is a beautiful picture. What do people observe in the gross picture over here? The pyramids are normal and then they are quite dark. But what I'm finding that the cortex also should be somewhat dark, but it is pale. Thanks to the wonderful work by Paul Fruits. And it's a case of acute tubular necrosis. No contraction, etc. But it is a pallor that gives us the diagnosis. So the tubules will be found in the medulla. Glomeruli more in the case of the cortex. So what happened? There is an injury over here. This is a normal tubule. I'm finding the low cuboidal or the columnar type of epithelium. And the absorptive surface is seen over here. They are all viable. This is a basement membrane. What happens when there is a shock? You find that there is a kind of damage to the lining epithelium. And some of the cells are also being denuded or they are getting lost. The basement membrane, however, remains intact. And finally, there can be a recovery with the multiplication of these cells in a few weeks. Liver is another organ you find it can happen in a case of peripheral circulatory failure because of the low BP. Also, it can happen in a case of cardiac diseases where there is a decreased amount of cardiac output. Within 24 hours, you find that there can be hepatic necrosis. Zone 3, that is the pericentral venular region, is the region that is affected. There is a collapse of the reticulin frame. The liver parenchyma is very well supported by means of the 
reticulum that collapses when there is a perivenular necrosis. Periportal architecture is nearly normal and there may be bile stasis or inflammation. And the reasons can be cardiac failure or it can be because of other conditions such as cirrhosis which aggravate the problem. Look at this over here. This is the central vein and there's a periportal region over here. This is more viable. The architecture is maintained. Whereas here it is necrotic. The cells are being pulled apart. There can be a collapse of the reticular framework with special stain I can demonstrate. Central lobular necrosis and viable periportal region. The same picture over here. And ultimately you find that can be an arrhythmia or an ischemic hepatitis which can be predisposing to this one. Abnormal heart rhythm, heart failure, and infection can also predispose to these things. The patient can develop a hypovolemic shock. Blood clots in the hepatic artery can be identified at surgery or at autopsy. Pancreas and pituitary. These are two organs which are minimally affected. There can be an acute pancreatitis or an acute hemorrhagic pancreatitis. And the second problem can be necrosis of the islet cell resulting in diabetes. Another organ is the pituitary. Here there can be hemorrhage and necrosis. You all would have heard of the Sheehan syndrome, though it is not specific to shock. It can occur in multiple endocrine neoplasia also. So there can be small foci of necrosis seen in this. So what happens is it is not only the pituitary that is getting affected, but also distal organs such as the pancreas resulting in diabetes. This is a beautiful explanation of the GIT. This is also affected in a case of a shock, more common in cases of curling ulcer and Cushing's disease. Basically, there is an intestinal vasospasm. Look at the picture. There are areas of grayishness. And so this is becoming unviable or dead compared with the viable area here. And even the mesentery here is becoming unviable. So it can be called a mesenteric necrosis or an intestinal necrosis also commonly seen in the valvulus or an intersubscription. So there is a term called as ischemic enterocolitis. Your Robbins described, describes very well. Two things you people will have to remember, transmural and submucous. What do I mean by it? Go to this reference, you people can see. And that is exactly what is being explained in this picture. So there's a normal intestine, there's a mucosa, and then the submucosa, muscular region, all are normal. Here there is a necrosis, there is some amount of hemorrhage and congestion in the submucosal region, but the muscular region is fired. But here all the layers are being affected, it becomes a transmural necrosis or infarct. So compare it with the histological picture, viable, here the mucosa is necrosed, here there is a transmural necrosis or infection. Brain. Not commonly affected, but we should be aware of the water shortages. It is important, particularly in septic shock, I shall tell you why. So there are the various arteries, anterior cerebral, middle cerebral, posterior cerebral. The junction of these arteries have the very lean branches and therefore the anastomosis is not adequate. This particular region is prone for an necrosis. That is why it is a watershed area. But then it is more common in a case of the meningococcal septicemia, wherein you find the waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome. Usually you find that the spinal cord and the brainstem are not affected, whereas the cerebellum and the Purkinje fibers can be affected. And the parietal and the occipital lobes, particularly at the depths of the sulci, sulci over here. So this particular depth, this particular region is more affected. That is what is being explained. Sometimes you find that in infants, the hypoxia plays a severe havoc. Probably the blood vasculature is not well done. Periventricular necrosis can be there. There can be a hypoperfusion and then a cerebral palsy. Then this is because of the regional variation in the blood supply and also the blood pressure. Exogenous neuroglutamate toxicity also plays a role. Adrenal, this is almost related to the brain and the meningococcal septicemia, you find that there is a case of extracarpostinal hematoma. So the, both the adrenals are affected. I'm finding the 
hemorrhage and a hematoma formation. At the same time, you find that there is a severe septic shock, the patient collapses. Autopsy, you find 14% of the cases, the adrenals are being affected. Microscopically, there is a lipid depletion, presence of hemorrhage and fibrin deposition. What is this lipid depletion? You find that normally you find these will be vacuolated cells that we are seeing. But in the zona fasciculata, the cells become more compact rather than clear. Apart from that, there can be areas of hemorrhage and necrosis. In summary, you find that it is a clinical syndrome associated with sustained hypotension. Shock is not an individual disease. It is a clinical syndrome. It can be because of hypovolemia, cardiac failure, sepsis, or anaphylaxis. There are two substances which we should remember, the vasoexciter and the vasodilator material. After some time, you find that it goes in for an irreversible shock, lactic acidosis, and cell injury. That we shall be seeing later on. In septic pathogenesis, the pathogenesis is unclear. That we have seen in the various flow diagrams. There can be a myocardial pump failure in a case of myocardial infarction. Anaphylaxis can occur because of the degranulation of the muscles. Microthrombi, hemorrhages, focal necrosis are all present. And fatality can be because of diffuse alveolar damage in the lung or the subendocardial infarction and sometimes disseminated intravascular coagulation. So this is a beautiful picture wherein you find there can be hemorrhage, fluid loss, basically a cardiac problem or anaphylaxis leading to hypovolemia, vasodilatation and a heart failure. So there is a decrease in the cardiac output and a hypoperfusion. There can be the various symptoms such as the cold, clammy skin. You can go back to Organs that are affected is kidney. There can be an oliguria, gastrointestinal. There can be hemorrhage. Lung, there can be a respiratory distress syndrome, hypoxemia, etc. So ultimately, you find that it is because of a cardiorespiratory failure or a multi-organ failure that happens. This is a beautiful flow diagram for the entire pathogenesis and overview of shock. Make it happen and you shock everyone. I think this can be a summary of the entire one. And please do remember, it is a class on septic shock, the pathogenesis and the organ changes. The other forms of shock will be dealt with at a later date. Thank you.